We're going to move on to our next speaker, Simon Walsh. He's the current chief executive officer of Alambi Care, where he has worked since 1998, developing and overseeing therapeutic programs for children, young people, and adults. I spoke to him earlier and I asked him about his favorite childhood memory. And he talked about a ritual that his family had that every time they went on holiday, they used to play table tennis together, which, yeah, I thought sounded really lovely. He was also equally happy and lit up as he said that. So please welcome to the stage our next speaker, Simon Walsh. Thank you very much. Well, you will. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks very much, guys, for, for giving me the opportunity um, to speak today. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, the Aboriginal people, past, present and, uh, and future, and, and especially those today who shared with us. Um, I was so inspired. Um, I think I'd like to start off today by just saying I'm, I'm a learner. Um, so CEO as a, as a position doesn't really fit well um, with me. Um, because it, it you know, implies this authority and a whole range of things, and I don't see myself necessarily as that. Um, but today, uh, I've been inspired and, and learned a lot just from listening to people, and, and not just inspired, um, people like Shane, like organisations should be full of people like you, um, who just absolutely rip out like new stuff uh, the, that create such experiences and opportunities um, that are so important to everyone's work of what's been discussed today. So thanks, Shane. I'm going to try and keep on track by uh, starting with frequently asked questions. Um, they get asked me all the time, so uh, where do I get my good looks from? That's pretty, pretty standard. Uh, trauma. Okay. So for me, uh, CEO uh, of a, quite a large organisation, by accident I must say, uh, father of four beautiful boys, um, beautiful wife, not a bad husband, I must say so. Um, just put there, I'm most comfortable in, we, we recently did a, a day on, uh, like a strategic planning day with our directors and our senior people of our organisation and one of the pictures that were put up by the presenter was uh, around um, people rowing boats like in nice calm even water or a chaotic sort of space with white water rafting and all that kind of stuff. And, I'm sitting there as she was speaking and I'm thinking, I hope she's going to say whitewater rafting's okay. Because that's me. Um, I love to be in that really chaotic space um, with our work and what we do. Uh, that's where I've learned that, that we're best, is sitting in that space with those people journeying that journey. Um, so for me, that's, that, that says a lot about me. And also connecting with people. I think um, relationship and people, and I think you've seen that through the presenters today. To me, that's, that's everything that we're all about. Um, and I think it leads our practice. I can't stand when someone sends me an email and they're only a couple of doors up uh, from me in, at work. I say, come and talk to me, I can't stand that. Um, so technology, maybe I'm a bit, uh, bit, bit challenged. So what's the most commonly used phrase uh, for me? Okay, if I only knew then what I know now. So my journey uh, started off, uh, we had really rich experiences. Um, our family had done foster care for many years. So I'd love that. Um, my parents were just amazing people, so had a really rich upbringing. Uh, went into nursing, started nursing at an early age, uh, but what I learned really quickly is, is that I didn't know enough to be caring for the people that I was caring for. I was really under-resourced in that space. Went on in my journey though as, as a youth worker. Um, so tell us more about Alambi Care. So I started my journey here uh, at Alambi Care, uh, probably about 21 years ago now. Um, so there was only four staff at that time. And I still remember to this day, one of my first shifts, uh, this window here that you can see on the side, what I learnt later is, is that that window can come out once all the screws are unscrewed and the whole panel come out. So I remember being asleep the first shift <laughs> and I receive a phone call. I thought I was all over this. My family had done foster care. I had the relational practice down pat. Kids loved me. We cooked dinner. Everything was going swimmingly. And, uh, Got to bed. Now, in the house at the time, we had four boys, four girls. You were by yourself as a, as a frontline worker. And we had this alarm system where the kids were allowed to get out, but if they did, the door reads went off and, you know, it wakes you up to go and engage and see what's going on. So, in bed, phone rang. It's probably about midnight. Been woken up by Dubbo Police. So, we're on the East Coast, okay? So, we're talking like in Newcastle, so probably about three and a half, four hours from Dubbo. And I get a phone call to say, we've just had a 
potential shootout with four boys who say that they're from your refuge. I'm like, it's like, who is this? This isn't the police. Now, my kids are in bed. Yes, this is a refuge, but this is what's going down. I would have been woken up. I'm all over this. The alarms would have gone off. Okay, so time went on. They said, can you go and check? I said, yeah, I'll go and check. So I go down, I turn the alarms off, went into the room, didn't want to turn the lights on because I knew they were asleep in bed. <laughs> Pillows underneath the blankets, little did I know. Looked at the, at the beds, went, yep, everything's good. I walk away, go back and tell the police, no, nah, I don't know who you've got in your care, but my kids are in bed. So he then gives me the names of these young people. I'm thinking, oh, wow. So I did go back down, turn the light on. Wow, didn't I learn? <laughs> so they'd taken the whole window out. Travelled to Dubbo in a stolen car, stumbled across a, a farmhouse looking for food, but found also some, art, uh, get so, some, some guns. Uh, and then next minute found themselves in a very serious situation with the police um, and potentially life-threatening. So for me, uh, the message in that is, is that the work we do is the most important work. What other job can you do or be involved in where that sort of stuff happens on a daily basis? <laughs> It's absolutely incredible. So my journey, I'm a learner and I've always been learning. We now run an organisation. You heard from Howard and, and Paul today, who's a part of our team, and I'm just so blessed to have so many great people around us that, that influence our practice and what we do. Um, we now have a, an organisation that has about 800 staff. Um, and that staff are made up from clinical to education staff, to frontline youth workers, to counsellors, you name it. Um, I'm actually not proud necessarily of growth. So that's the one thing I just want to be really clear with. So the fact that, that our industry is growing is a bit of a concern to some degree. But as you know, when you're doing really good stuff, and I'm sure Shane would have experienced this, next minute you get lots of more phone calls to say, can you keep doing this and can you do this? So one of the, th the things is, is about our journey um, was about trying to diversify then and take in this, this um, concept of how do we care for kids well. So we have about 605 families in, in our community outreach and our family um, work that we do. So most of our efforts now are really about how do we keep kids connected with family and community, which is probably what I'm proud about with our growth. So our growth isn't about you know, how we've grown, although this, we have 98 intensive therapeutic care, which is now you can see the words being introduced into our, our practice of therapeutic care. It was just residential care, but now contracts dictate that it's uh, therapeutic. But I wonder whether people actually understand what that meant when they introduced those words into our contracts. We have a, a large foster care group, and we were a part of that, it was mentioned before, the launch site for the NDIA. So we are a part of that, I think, building the plane in the, in the air is that concept. Why we're so good at what we do, I believe, is because of our people. Um, it's been a really important journey. Um, and I guess it's been a, a one of interest um, for many people to say, why do you do so well? And how can you have grown an organisation like that? So we have made a choice not to actually grow into other areas across the state that we've stayed very central to the Newcastle Hunter Central Coast area. So it's quite a large organisation for such a, a small patch. Um, and if anything, like I said, we're trying to, to minimise that. This, this is a bit of a snapshot of the services that now wrap around our organisation. So our individual fa individuals and our families sit at the centre of our work at all times. Um, and essentially what we've done is we've been able to grow um, parts of our organisation that wrap around. So this idea that an organisation needs to be really fluent at all times. So one of the things that we've learned over time uh, now is that an organisation that is going to be sort of you know, held by the contracts and not being able to give flexibility in their contracts um, find that really tough to, to be able to manoeuvre around innovation. So when you find people like Paul or Howard and they bring such good work to you, you need to be able to infuse that into your work as quick as possible and as strongly as possible. So we started many projects. So things up there, we've got a Youth Hope program, Better Options. Better Options was started out of a concept where we were doing a program called Youth Hope, which was funded, which is about trying to prevent kids coming into care. So working in the family homes. So facts were receiving or the government services were receiving uh, level one ROS reports, a risk of harm reports, and we would go into those family homes and actually work with those, family, uh, those families and try and prevent them from coming into care and wrap around all the services that you've heard and all those models that you've heard earlier today from Paul and Howard. 
So from there, um, we've built services like Better Options. And one of the challenges for us is that Better Options was born out of a conversation that took place from Sydney to Newcastle, where we went to the department and we said, look, we, we really need to expand Youth Hope. We're doing really well. And we're finding that we're, we're being able to engage and keep families together. So what happened was that Fax, you know, and, and no disrespect, found that very difficult to have that conversation to work out how are we going to funnel some of the funding, which is what we were asking them to do, into doing things differently. Um, we were asking them to, to expand that model because we were having such success and we were moving kids from residential care back home with families and keeping them engaged within the community, which was really powerful. So on that drive home, one of the things talking about flexibility and, and, and being innovative, uh, we were able to have a conversation and we said, look, because they, they were finding it difficult to say how they're going to attach that. We have an ability in our organisation to do fee-for-service work. So we said on the way home, why don't we just do it? Why don't we just actually bite the bullet and actually start doing the work? So we said, right, what are we going to call it? What, you know, and we were talking about what was happening with the youth hope. And he said, well, it's a better option. I said, well, let's call it better options. So that's how technical sometimes our space becomes in regards to integrating the work that we've done with trauma and everything else. It's about actually taking that moment when you find something and you know it's got to work in the context and jumping on it straight away and not waiting for some kind of invitation or formal contract. So we've also started programs such as our uh, learning centre. So we have a, a program called Learning Without Walls. So we have many kids within our program who can't engage within a school setting for many different reasons. So we, we stopped arguing with those schools for, for a, a good reason. There's a good reason why some of those kids can't be in those school settings. Many of our kids are at least seven years behind their uh, abilities at school in regards to where they're at. Um, so we started a program called Learning Without Walls and we decided to employ teachers versus youth workers, which is very different for us. But we did that because we wanted teachers to be wrapped around these kids when they weren't able to be in school. We also wanted to make sure that no matter what happened when those kids were exited from school, that they could have someone engaging with them with their educational journey. And we also didn't want to become another school within the sector because there was lots of schools and lots of different school models that were being offered. We thought there was a gap between when a kid couldn't be at school and when that person was then sitting at home with a foster carer by themselves on distant education. So that's where we coined this term, learning without walls. Funding is, is a very difficult thing with that too because a part of that journey is understanding then how do we actually seek that out. And quite often our journey at Alambi Care has been that we go after what's right first and we look for the funding afterwards. And, and that has worked really well for us because in doing that people see the benefit of what we're doing and, and the proof's in the pudding is the old saying, I guess you might say. So this is a bit of a snapshot of what the organisation looks like now. Um, Interesting, um, we have such amazing people wrapped around me um, as you've met today and many more back um, in our organisation, but it's not a real hierarchical organisation. Everyone takes charge of all the bits and pieces that you see and the people that we care for are right dead smack centre of everything we do. It's been really important that when we learn things about trauma and learn about the journey like Howard's work or Paul's work, that it is then infused within the organisation in a really um, in you know, a steady way that, organ like that all of your staff understand and are able to digest. So, how do we do this? <laughs> Firstly, I'll share a part of the journey. So there were some great people along the way for us. So many people in the room, I'm sure, would uh, be aware of the Circle of Courage, is that right? Okay, so um, we were introduced uh, to the Circle of Courage by Howard, actually, previous to Howard working for Lambie. Um, where he said, you've got to come over to the States and, and see this work. Because I was talking to him about our organisation. We started as this small crisis refuge. And at that time, we were full of really good people who actually just loved their work and did things by accident, you might say, or based on their experiences to take Paul's work, looking at what we had rich experiences and then sharing that back. So we were really good at what we did, but I don't know if we really understood what that looked like or why. So we were in search of a model or a, a theory behind what we did because as we got bigger and as people said, look, you've got to come along and you, know, you need to take more kids, we need to start, we were saying, whoa, 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 you know, like we need to keep the quality of care that we're giving as well. So we went on search for a model, something that we could share and train um, that made sense and that was really rich um, in, in its background, but also then rang true to who we were from our values. And this is where we met these three gentlemen. So Martin Brokenleg and Larry Brentrow and Steve Van Bocken through the circle of courage. 
We then, through that journey, were introduced to people like Paul and Howard. Um, so you can see these many good people who offer you many, many good theories and, and uh, experiences in regards to what you can take back to an organisation. But it doesn't stop at just being introduced to those people, it actually then has to be infused back into your organisation. So to me, uh, you know, this concept of trauma was like the elephant in the room um, for a long time. It was being spoken about everywhere, but did people really understand what that meant on the front line? Were people actually introducing it within their organisation or was it being infused within their organisation? So for us, it was a journey about what we felt and need um, for our young people and for the families and, and the people we were serving. So we, we kept to this concept, I guess, that everything needed to be simple, but at the same time, can't be any simpler than it needs to be. The idea is, is that, obviously, um, we need to, to make sure that the front line, the people that experienced what I experienced, the first shift that I had, it was digestible for them. Because no matter what we think, they're the, the, the people that are serving our kids now um, within our organisations. So we spent a long time looking at that. Um, and we took all the really wise people that were wrapped around us, as well as all the people that were on the front line. And we looked at what does that mean for, for our organisation. And this is what we come up with, a needs-based framework. So for us, this is what leads our whole organisation, um, right from the top down. And it would be really difficult for me to share that within a very short space. Um, with you about the, the intricate parts of how that falls down. But every single interaction that we have with our young people and all of the training, everything that we do within the organisation falls from these basic principles. First, so firstly, from our learnings from Brentro um, and his colleagues around the circle of courage. So we have our universal needs and our universal needs all wrap around basically the principle of what we also apply for our staff. So making sure that people feel like they belong in the organisation, that they're upskilling themselves, they're able to be actually independent in what they do, and there's that element, I guess, of giving back or being a part of something that's bigger than themselves as well. So they're a universal snapshot. Then we have trauma-related um, sort of practice that we've infused. Now, for me, that was all built into the circle of courage when I first started to, to understand and look at how it's worked. But it wasn't explicitly explained through the circle of courage. And what we then realise is that we really need to make sure that our frontline staff and people wrapped around the, the people that we care for needed to have that well explained and laid out. So we had Howard's three pillars of felt safety, healthy connections and adaptive coping and all of our work now within our houses, within our works, all of our forms and the things that we do with our kids are all related back to that language so they understand what they're doing as well. And then we also then started to recognise that, tr I think Howard talked about t today that, you know, th there's a bit of traumania happening. Um, it's not everything to do with our organisation. We work with many people with disabilities, with very unique and individual needs. And particularly our clinical team that Paul heads up really has a greater understanding and we needed to make sure that all the individual needs of the people that we were caring for were also then built into the plans and the planning for the people that we were caring for. So this made up our philosophy and our concept, our framework of viewing how we care for, for the people in our organisation. So, what do we know now that I wish that I knew then? That a framework-led organisation, for me, um, has been absolutely central to, to the success of, of what we do. Growth has really not been a part of our journey. We really don't want to be growing as an organisation, um, but we definitely want to be doing better we have got so far to go. Like if you were asked me, you know, how far would you go? People see our organisation and hear about what we do and they go, wow, that's really inspiring. You've really got trauma and a whole range of other things built within your systems and you're caring for people well. I think we're down here. We're well at the beginning of what we can do um, if we actually infuse it. What I've learnt now that is that this has given us the ability to actually integrate and to work with people effectively um, and for people to understand what our mission and our values, our goals are for everyone that we're serving. What I've learnt though is, is that it's much bigger than just the Lambie. So it has a lot to do with education, with health. That's why a Lambie has organically grown with their clinical team, with their education department they run. Everything has been based on the people that we serve. So if they, we can't find something within the community, then we create it. That's been sort of our, our organic growth along the way. 
And I think that's really kept us in, in good stead with the people that we care for and it kept us in, in our, I guess, our values and our mission really clear um, because everything that we do is based on making sure that it's serving the frontline people, the people that we're there for and that we're funded to care for. Okay, the staff. So there's many things that I could talk about today and I know it's short time and this panel and I'd prefer having questions too from you guys. So for staff, this was just a gathering we had recently. And I think this says it all, that you know, if you don't feed the staff, then they'll eat the children. <laughs> and to me, that's what it's all about. Um, staff to me says much more than just sort of training and education that might typically come to mind. It's everything. Your people that wrap around you, like it's, it's the, the shames of the world, like you, you really want to make sure that you're developing and understanding who you've got and what position and what can they do. What do they bring into the team and not being stale in the role that they play. There's also things that you need to be creative, okay? Um, so for me, one of the creative things that we've done recently that I'll share with you today, um, we had to create a, a learning experience. So one of the things as we grew that was keeping me up at night was the fact that did I know that the frontline staff that we're now employing, if I didn't get to them, or some of the other key people that I know didn't get to them, were they understanding what their role and function was within the organisation? Were they upholding our values? So we decided uh, that we were going to start uh, an internal diploma because we thought, well, people don't, it's hard to get people to training. People don't want to come to training all the time, particularly if it's in their own time. So we decided, okay, but if they're going to get something for it, then we'll be much better off. And then also the department were asking for upskilling and they wanted a, a level, whether it was Cert for a diploma or a degree base for everything that people were doing on the front line. So we decided to go into, we didn't want to become everything, so we spoke to an RTO. And the RTO was someone who'd worked in the department as a, as a lead trainer for a long time. So it wasn't someone who was unfamiliar with the work. It was Devange from Queensland. Um, and what we did is we said to him, we're interested in building our own diploma. So we took the standards of the diploma and we looked at every single aspect of our needs-based framework and our training. And what we did is we wrapped that into those elements of the, the, the diploma and that learning experience. And what that's done for us now is given us a sense of like, it's a massive sense of achievement, but it's given us the ability to know that our staff are actually being educated and being able to enact what we're asking them to enact on a daily basis. It's making sure that they're actually, so the other thing is, is quite creative with it is, is that the cost of those things, typically to go and get a diploma at TAFE, you're looking between ten and $15,000. Um, if you're going through TAFE, there's other methods. But for us, because of the relationship that we built with the RTO, we're looking at just shy of $1,000. Now, we would naturally then put that into staff anyway for staff development if you look at that over a period of time. So we run the diploma over 18 months and we decided, well, that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to pay back. So if staff stay with us. Now, typically with our kids, the biggest number one thing that our kids find hard in their, uh, their world is, well, there's many things, but one of the typical things that I hear is, is that, that idea of multiple people people coming in and out of my life. So for me as a CEO, my goal was about having staff stick around for kids, upskilling them. For the staff, it's about the diploma. So running out of time, but the next level was then, people heard about that and I was starting to get intrigued. And we said, what about a degree, a bachelor's level degree? Stuff it, let's go for it. So that's been our next part of our journey. So as of July, um, through ACU, we're starting a human services degree that we've created with them and they're getting recognition for their diploma as well as their work in the workplace because we're being able to map that. So when we think outside the box and we look at the work from a practical sense with trauma and what we're doing, there is so much that we can do in that space in regards to innovation and difference with our, our work. Recently, uh, we, we got a video put together. Um, for me, people say, oh, how did you get so many people? Like, how, how do you get these video clips? Because we do a whole range of things. There's a staff member who said to me, I'm really good with the camera, can I actually put something together for you? And it was like, yep, no problems at all. Um, so this guy now has taken that on as part of his role, but again, he didn't have that as his full-time job within LMB Care, he now does because of the growth and what it's done. But what's happened is, is that he wanted to do that on top. So he wanted to capture lots of stuff with different kids. And this was a video that we did because we said we need to be seen much more in the community. So we wanted to send something out to the local council to everybody about what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve. And so this was the, the clip. Lambie Care is a homegrown local organisation serving your community.
Landicare is a family of like-minded and passionate people that achieve great things for our community. Foster caring is both challenging and rewarding and Alambi have been a great support throughout our journey. Alambicare is a can-do attitude, no matter how overwhelming the challenge may seem. The Alambicare team has helped me become more independent and follow my dreams. Care is a team of motivated people who are uniquely trained to deliver specialist support services. Alambi Care has brought back our brother's smile from when he was younger. Alambicare is a team that offers support and empowerment to local families. Alambicare supports us and our family. Care is making a difference in your neighbourhood. So you have no idea how uncomfortable I was making that video clip. That's so far from who I am in many different ways, but I'm told that we need to put ourselves out there if we want people to recognise how great we are and how professional our, our organisation and our industry is. And that we need to raise that profile because we need to look at making sure that the bits and pieces that we do every day is actually received well so that we can make an impact on that front line. So I guess things that you've heard today. So now that you know what you know, what will you do to improve the lives of the people that you serve? And I think uh, I'll leave you guys with that. Thank you. Thank you.